appreciate the opportunity to be here. And of course, Guyton is just a fellow servant of the Most High God. And so any fellow servant of the Most High God, I am friends with and I'm a supporter of him or her. And uh, I do remember meeting him a long time ago when he was uh, setting up a display for the Northwest School of Biblical Studies. And he's the one that told me that about that distance thing. I thought, really? I didn't know that. But sure enough, man, I punched it in GPS and it's uh, 433 miles from, my, my, or from the FSOP to here. And from here to Memphis, I think, is uh, 460 or something like that, 470 or something. I thought, wow, and he's got to go through two states to get there. Maybe three, depends on which way he goes. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so I do appreciate being here and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And i um, supposed to have a PowerPoint up there somewhere, but it's coming, right? But we were a minute late getting in here. But um, yeah, and of course the big question we'll start off with is John, is it Smythe or Smith? I don't know how they pronounced it back then. I tend to think they pronounced it Smythe, but I'm going to go ahead and pronounce it Smith so you don't, don't uh, freak out about that. I know one time, and I think he was mispronouncing it, but I sat at a lesson and he was speaking about Pharaoh. And I don't know if he did this on purpose or not, or for Freudian slip, but he called him Fario. And throughout the whole lesson, it was Fario this, Fario that. And that was about the time, you know, the, you know, um, Pride Month and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, Fario, just, uh, it just ate at me the whole lesson. I still remember to this day. So I'm just going to call him John Smith, uh, although Smythe is probably it. I know with an E at the end of it, I have a preacher friend who has connections with some of those Ivy League schools. And he talked to one of the heads of the chairs in one of those schools in the English literature department, and he said, Smythe is how it was probably pronounced. And so I would go with that, but again, for Smith. But I have subtitled this, uh, An Unfulfilled Quest for Truth and the Baptist Church Along the Way. And if you study his life, as I did, over the, and I do appreciate the assignment of this lesson, I would probably have never studied him like this or really any of these people. I know different, uh, different preachers have different interests, and I know several that are very interested in church history, denominational history, and uh, even restoration history, and I admire that. My, best, my favorite church history subject is the restoration movement during the Civil War, but that's about it. The American Civil War, that is. But uh, when you read about him, he changed his views quite a bit going through his life. And uh, those views being changed, we'll say more about that at the end when we look at some applications of his life. But that could indicate, uh, to me anyway, it indicates a quest for truth. And one thing we have to realize about John Smith that I don't think as Americans we can really fully appreciate the background of his life. And several of the speakers have mentioned this, but in America we come from a background of freedom. For generations, freedom, freedom. We have the ability to move about our country. Uh, we have ability to make decisions. And I know some segments of our population in, the, in our history, going back a couple hundred years, did not have that freedom. Uh, but now we do. And uh, there are some, some things with that that uh, maybe in the background that we're not all maybe feel the same way about that. But the point is, we don't know what it's like to live where the government tells you exactly what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And when you combine that with religion, the church, uh, like the Roman Catholic Church, for example, back in that day, they were just as much a political, maybe even more so, a political force than a religious force, and they mixed that together. And so in his background, like many of those backgrounds, there was that structure of the church and the state together pressing you, pressing its population to believe one thing, and if you didn't believe it that way, you had civil persecution punishment of the state uh, was at hand. And so this is the background in which John Smith, Smith lived. He lived in England. He was born and raised in England. And we're going to look at him under a couple headings. We'll look at his early life. We'll look at him as a separatist. We'll look at him as a Baptist. We'll look at him as a Mennonite. And then we'll look at his legacy and make some practical applications as we go along the way. Now he was born in 1570, and I know that this does not deal with his early life, but he died of tuberculosis in 1612. And when you think about that, we'll say a little bit about the English Reformation in just a moment, but Martin Luther was credited as beginning the Reformation, Reformation movement in 1517 when he nailed his 95 theses on the church house door in Wittenberg, Germany. And uh, yes, two years ago uh, uh, was their 500, 500th year anniversary of that event. And um, 
I'm, I'm the sign minister for the South Florida Avenue Church of Christ, and not this kind of sign, but uh, the marquee out there. We're, we're uh, located on the busiest north-south north, south road in Lakeland, and uh, I forget the millions of people that see that thing, but in 2017 I put up there something about no Protestant denomination can trace its roots back more than 500 years. And on the other side of the sign I said the New Testament church was established about A.D. 33, common way we figure time now. But anyway, so he was born in the midst of that beginning of that Reformation movement. Now he's in England, which is on that little island out there, and the continent is where all that stuff is going on, and England too. And we'll have more to say about that in a moment. Uh, he was again, like most of these Reformation guys, he was trained to be, a, uh, well not like some, most of them, he was trained to be an Anglican priest. And uh, so he was a fellow, he was educated there at uh, Christ College in Cambridge, England, very prestigious place, uh, from 1594 to 1598. And he was ordained an Angl Anglican priest in 1600 and to 1602. And his title was City Preacher, City Preacher at a place called Lincoln. And uh, that was his title. And that meant more to the structure of the Anglican church than we would think of that. But that was a title that was given him by the Anglican church. All right, now Smith as a separatist, and here's where we really pick up on his life. Uh, he was part of that Reformation movement in England. Now there are several factors for that. I'm just going to put those up there on a list. And uh, maybe I probably should start with Luther's writings were well circulated. The last one there, and of course Luther wrote a lot uh, as he broke away from the Catholic Church early in that century. And his writings were well circulated in England. And uh, also you have that uh, the Lollards, now the Lollards were Wycliffe's followers. And uh, they had been going against Catholic Church from the 1400s. And uh, so that was well in place in England. And again at this time, and I think one of the speakers had mentioned that yesterday, a movement is not a thing that just happens like that. You know, you didn't wake up one morning and there's the English Reformation. You didn't wake up one morning and, you know, I guess it did took him one day to just tack those 95 theses on the door. But there was a lot of stuff leading up to that. There was a lot of stuff in response to that that led to all these, these things going on here. Where the Lollards were already preaching in England and teaching against Roman Catholicism. Also England was a strong state by itself. They were also on kind of an island. And so they had less reliance, less dependence on the Roman Catholic Church. Again, the Roman Catholic Church dictated a lot of political, a lot, a lot of things back in Europe in that day. And we can, I don't think, fully appreciate that, though we can look at that in textbooks and all that and kind of imagine how that might have been. But if you weren't right with the Roman Catholic Church as a city, as a state, you suffered. And so everybody would be in conformity to, would want to be in conformity to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, England wasn't so much that way, especially in the 1500s is when uh, King Henry VIII broke away uh, from the Catholic Church and the Church of England was established uh, only without the Pope being the head. Now you had the King being the head of the Church. But it's pretty much the same doctrine except for the marital type stuff because he wanted to marry, he wanted to divorce and remarry and all that to get a male heir. And so you had that going on in England. So there was already set against kind of Roman Catholicism as he is born and as he is reared into that. Now again he was, and also yeah, Bible translations was also a big factor. Several of the sources that I read and I'm sure the others who studied this, Reformation progressed in direct proportion to translations becoming available in the native languages, in German, Luther, in English, uh, Tyndale, Coverdale, Erasmus had a lot to do with that. And so when the Bible is read in the plain English or the language, the language of the common people, they can read the Bible for themselves. And um, with the translations came persecution, of course, the Roman Catholic Church. Mass was in Latin really all the way up until uh, I think in the 1960s when they allowed it to be in other languages. Um, but, you know, the common person at that time was pretty much illiterate. And I've never seen a study on that, which country had the most literacy at that time. I don't know. It's a follow-up study I'll try to do one day on the back burner with about 400 others, uh, further studies. But anyway, most people were illiterate back then anyway. And then if you have, have to know Latin, how are you going to understand anything? And furthermore, the, the Bibles were chained to the pulpits back then. 
I visited a church, uh, I was doing a meeting in Bermuda one time, and Bermuda has an old Catholic church there. And uh, it's, the doors are, well, I think they started locking them now, but this was about eight, ten years ago. You could go in any time of the day and go in and see that. And they didn't have the, pul the Bible chain there, but they did have the pulpit and had spiral stairs going up to it. And they had a place where there was, they, they would say that the Bible used to be chained to that place. They didn't want the Bible in the hands of the common folk for obvious reasons. But with the Bible translations, people could read the Bible now for themselves and analyze what's going on in their world. And so that was part of his background growing up. All right, he sympathized with the Puritan leaders. Uh, he objected to popish, uh, as he would call them, abuses. And, um, of course, in, in Europe and the continent, you had the uh, indulgences for sale, which, by the way, the first thing, the first book printed on the printing press was the Bible, of course, but the first piece of paper printed and distributed from the printing press was an indulgence where you could buy the remission of your sin. Uh, that wasn't so much in England because I guess, you know, well, among the Church of England anyway, but he objected to popish abuses. Whoops, I don't know if I pressed the one button. Oh, that's a little bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, and also he opposed state churches. And Mark mentioned that last night with the Mennonites, and this was um, a very beginning common thing. And what he meant by state churches was a church that's operated by the state that forces you to believe what they want you to believe. And if you don't believe that, you could get civil penalties for that, jail time, you know, the rack, those sort of things you see at Disney where they stick their heads in there. I forget what they call that. But all those things were part of that. In fact, if you go down to Orlando and you go to that medieval times there, they have a, they have a, a torture museum. Uh, where they have these old pieces of torture that they used to torture people with. Well, they don't tell you religiously, but that's what it was, religiously. All kinds of stuff that, uh, that uh, they, they would use to torture people that went against the status quo religion of the state. Well, these guys were opposed to that. And in fact, it was mentioned here, I'll mention as well, that Smith had a lot of influence on the pilgrims that came over here. And what was the main reason they came over here for? Religious freedom. Religious freedom. And that was a real thing back then. So he opposed state churches, which would have been the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Again, the king or the queen, right now the queen is the head of that church. Can you imagine that? Now I realize that's just on paper. They got some other stuff going on as well. But he opposed that. All right, so he was a Church of England. And, and by the way, one thing that's, uh, that I found a challenge in studying church history, denominational history, is there are several ways to refer to the same thing. So the Church of England and the Anglican Church is the same thing. And the Episcopalian Church in America is the American version of the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And my grandparents were kind of part of that, although they were also part of, uh, what do you call those guys, the, uh, you know, the stars and all that, the, um, ah, man, you know, the, no, the pyramid, yeah, you're getting close though. Yeah, the Masons, there you go. I kept thinking Mennonites, Mennonites, but Masons. Yeah, they were part of the Masons, but anyway. Yeah, by the way, I did not grow up in the church. and hear, never even heard of the Church of Christ. I was about 18 years old, a senior in high school. I flunked a grade, so I should have been out of high school. But the providence of God kept me right there, I guess. But anyway, um, and so I, I kind of know what it's like to search for truth, put it that way. And, but I know what it's like to find it uh, also, and that's a good thing. But anyway, so he uh, began to question and to speak out against some of the practices of the Church of England, which again was basically Roman Catholicism in England without the Pope and with different marriage laws. But everything else was basically the same. And I know that's kind of a, a general statement, but about everything else was about the same. Now, the King James I of England, who also is known as King James VI of Scotland, uh, he actually reigned in both places, but I guess they put the Roman numeral where you are first. So he was the first King James to be in England, but the sixth to be in Scotland. And he was the first one to claim uh, rule over Great Britain uh, as the whole, you know, Scot Scotland and England. I don't know what Ireland did back in the day, but we do have uh, one of our graduates, Graham MacDonald. Some of you may know him. He's a missionary over in Scotland, and he will tell you uh, he, he, he'll tell you all about that stuff if you ask him, and he's, he's good at that. But anyway, this King James is the same one of KJV fame, the Bible translation fame. But when he took the throne in England, he started uh, his, his mission, part of his mission was to clean up all these rebellions going on. 
And so he uh, began persecuting or persecuting separatists in 1603 when he ascended the throne of England. And uh, he wanted to either um, make them conform or rid the land of them because they were seen as enemies of the state as well as enemies of the church. And so Smith, about this time, he dropped the title City Preacher, which meant much more uh, to the Church of England than what we might think of it as. And he just began to call himself a minister and preacher of the Word of God. Now that was a very courageous move because it was a public uh, avowal. I'm getting rid of this. I'm, it was a public movement away from the Church of England. And around this time he renounced Anglicanism in 1605. And around this time he was said to have renounced Calvinism. But as we're going to see uh, toward the end of this in some of his statements and stuff, there's still that lingering Calvinistic approach right there. Even though he did, he was known to have renounced it. And so he separated from, he began separating uh, from the Church of England. And this brings us to his founding of the Baptist Church, his Baptist Church founding. All right, and so with the persecution, now remember the persecution began as King Henry, or not King Henry, but King James I uh, ascended the throne in 1603. And of course, like a lot of that, it didn't just start right away. You know, there was a strategy, I'm sure, and a planning and a carrying out of it. And uh, during this time, between 1605 and 1608, and maybe even a little before 1605, Smith was actually put in prison a few times. He was, you know, uh, beaten, and he was persecuted uh, for his views. And uh, of course, they were trying to get him to conform, uh, but instead he fled to Amsterdam. Now Amsterdam was a haven of separatists. There was already a large population over there by the time he came there. So he came in there and he joined that group uh, of separatists. Now um, I want to mention this, uh, separatists, when you hear the word separatist, you hear the word Puritan. Uh, they all had some basic beliefs, but they didn't agree on everything. And this was also mentioned in some of the previous lessons. And I kind of compare it today. Um, you know, we have movements in the brotherhood, you know, antiism, non-institutionalism, however you want to name that. We have liberalism going on. And, um, and of course, uh, like the Florida School of Preaching, you know, we're celebrating our 50th year this year. And uh, I'm just the third director of the school's history. And I think that speaks pretty good for the uh, consistency of it and all that, the stability of it. But anyway, you know, we're located down in there in central Florida between Orlando and Tampa. Been at the same location, 1807 South Florida Avenue since 1969. Um, but, uh, you know, there's some, some segments of the Brotherhood think we are far right. I mean, and that a lot of that comes from the, um, you know, the Crossroads Movement coming along in the late 70s, early to mid 80s. Uh, you know, elders at South Florida Avenue, B.C. Carr, and some of those associated with the school, they spoke out against that quite a bit. And so a lot of the congregations from about Orlando are right up the center of the state. They still don't have anything to do with us. They think we're far-right radicals, okay? Uh, of course, the way that thing evolved into the ICC and all that, I think kind of vindicated those brethren way back, fighting against it. But anyway, but then the other segments of the Brotherhood, they think of us as a bunch of liberals, man, because we don't jump on the bandwagons. We don't, you know start writing up people and all that kind of stuff. So they think of us as, as liberals. Well, we're, you know, in fact, I have letters in my office now where people say we teach false doctrine on this or false doctrine on that. And uh, I've questioned those guys. Oh, the guy that wrote that letter, he's dead. Uh, so forget that, you know. But, you know, we are well documented. We got lectureship books going back to 1994. We have class notes. We have our Harvester publications been put out since the 70s, I think. Uh, so we're well documented. And so, so you, you show us where we're teaching false doctrine and we'll, we'll address it. But, uh, you know, they don't, they don't do that. But I say all that to say that when we say anteism, for example, non-institutionalism. And by the way, Florida College is about 45 minutes from, from the campus, our campus, FSOP. And, um, you know, there's a lot of changes and sometimes people will confuse us with them, you know. Uh, we'll get phone calls every once in a while, and there's a story told way before my time that somebody left some money for us, but they addressed it the Florida Christian School of Preaching or something like that. And there were some, you know, side deals made and incorporations made just so they could cash that $10,000 check that we didn't get, but, you know, uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. But the point is, when you say non-institutional, we think of that as one group, but it's not. You got 
no kitchen in the church building people. You got, you know, no support of orphan home people. And so there's all kinds of flavors of that. So when I say separatists up here, um, you know, there's all kinds of, they didn't all get along with one another. And Smith, he was kind of, all, he, he was getting caught on all sides because he was speaking out against all over, all over the place. And uh, so he was getting, kept getting caught on all sides. And so, you know, and, and of course there is some, you know, there's progress being made with restoring a fellowship on both ends of that right there in Lakeland, Florida. We got both ends of that going on. So if you see uh, some of our guys speaking at churches that, that, that are known as liberal, you know, ask me about it. We'll let you know. That there's some progress trying to be made in some of that stuff. And if you hear me speaking at a non-institutional place, it's because there's progress being made. And uh, we're going to go about it the biblical way, and so we're just going to do that. But um, we're just going to try to get that going. But anyway, uh, but I say all that to say that Smith, Baptist, Mennonite, I think uh, Mark mentioned that, Mennonite, these groups, there's all kinds of different beliefs within these groups. And uh, this is the only thing that's going to determine whether who's right or who's wrong or who's, 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 who's expedient, who's not, or whatever. This right here is going to answer all that for us. But Smith, when he goes to Amsterdam, now again, he, he, he is, he, the first most obvious thing he's speaking out against is baptism. Baptism. Now he gets to Amsterdam, he doesn't know, you know, communication is not like what it is today. Didn't have Facebook, didn't have Instagram and all this, didn't have email or Google. So he doesn't know all the different groups that are there. So he baptizes himself, he confessed and baptized himself. Now, confessional baptism is a, is a term I never heard of until I was at a lectureship not too long ago or I took a class somewhere and the guy mentioned confessional baptism. I was like, what in the world is that? And then I studied for this and now I kind of put all that together. You know, when an infant is baptized, he doesn't make any confession at all. He's either dunked in the water, he's either poured on, he's either sprinkled on. He has no clue or she has no clue what that's all about. But a confessional baptism, a confession is where if someone says something, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, for example, then he's baptized. And so that confession is another way to distinguish infant baptism versus adult baptism. Or someone who is rational, who can believe and be baptized, who can repent and be baptized, who can make a confession, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's another way, again, to distinguish infant baptism from an adult being baptized, knowing what he's doing. All right, now, he did immerse himself. He baptized himself, okay? Uh, one of the doctrines he held, and the reason why he baptized himself is because he put a lot of weight in the person that baptized, okay? And there's brethren today that think if you're not baptized by a famous preacher like Apollos in Acts chapter 18, then your baptism is no good. Um, and he believed that way. So he thought there was no one who was not, you know, if you were baptized as an infant, you're not a Christian. And if you were baptized as an infant, you cannot baptize me because you baptizing me won't count because you're not a Christian. And no, of course, how could he be a Christian to baptize himself? But that's another story. He'd have to work that out himself, you know. <laughs> Again, we're going to go by the book here. But he baptized himself, uh, and because he baptized himself, there was another separatist, Richard Bernard. He was already in Amsterdam. And so he derided Smith, and he, he called him, he nicknamed him the Say Baptist. And Say is a Latin expression. He baptized, he's the self-baptizer. And that was said in derision. He was a self-baptizer. And uh, his, his followers, in fact, let me just put that up there. After he baptized himself, he baptized his followers. And there's about 40 or 50 of them. He baptized them. And they called them, they tried to call themselves the Christians baptized on confessing of their faith. But that's a really long title. So the Sea Baptist or the Say Baptist kind of stuck and then it was further shortened to Baptist. And that's what they were known as historically. That's a lot easier to say, the Baptist. Okay? But it was a name that was out of derision, Say Baptist. He's a self-baptizer. You know, who does he think he is? Baptizing himself. And so uh, that's how that came about. Now I have in there pouring with the question mark because um, there are some documents that will say that he, he practiced pouring. 
and there was not a generation till immersion came along. Now, I do believe he was immersed because, again, well, I don't know. Um, only the Lord knows for sure. Now, there is a document, and uh, Keith Seisman, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, he wrote a book, um, The Eternal, uh, not The Eternal Kingdom, that was somebody else. Trace of the Kingdom, yeah, Trace of the Kingdom. There have been some questions about the book and the historical accuracy and all that stuff, the book, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about that here. But uh, he does have a, um, supposedly, and of course on the internet, some internet sources will say that it's fraudulent or whatever. Uh, some letter from a Baptist church back in the 1600s, it did say that he was baptized, walked two miles and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, so you will see that sometimes about pouring and all that. Uh, but we'll have something to say about what he thought about baptism in just a moment. So uh, as far as eternity is concerned, it wouldn't really matter. But anyway, we'll see that in just a moment. All right, but he did baptize himself. But that, but that name Baptist did come from this Bernard guy, at least historically speaking, who called him that out of derision, and the name kind of stuck with that. Now, among those he baptized, his followers, is a man by the name of Thomas Helwis. Helwis. And again, like the brother said, I'm not sure if that's being pronounced right, but, you know, the, the Orthodox, the, uh, you know, those guys will figure all that out. But anyway, um, he was baptized along with him, and he later became, and we'll say that in just a moment, but he later became the the leader of the Baptist church after um, Smith joined the Mennonites. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. All right, now Smith and the Mennonites here. Um, again, in, Am in, Am in Amsterdam, after he baptized himself, after he began the Baptist church, his followers, which really just a small group of his followers, he did later meet and discover the, some Anabaptist Mennonites who were there. And they were already practicing baptism based upon confession for a few generations before he even got there. And again, it just kind of goes to show that just like with the Restoration Movement, you know, Barn W. Stone and Campbell and these guys, they were already separate, not even knowing one another. Even, even the relationship between Thomas and Alexander there, there was that period of time where they didn't have a whole lot of contact. But they were separately on their own trying to go back to the Bible. Well, just like these Reformation leaders, their lifetime overlaps, even though Luther is credited with beginning it officially. But there were these guys that were already, you know, speaking about against the Catholic Church, trying to go back to the Bible. They were already there going on all over the place. And so that was also true in Amsterdam. There were already people that he later discovered that were baptizing by immersion based upon a confession. And so he uh, then considered himself, what he had started with the Baptist church, you know, I'm a Johnny come lately. These guys were already the original ones doing that in his mind. And so he began to question his self-baptizing. And he kind of put that in the same category. This was a mistake I made along the path of seeking truth. And so he denounced the Baptist church and joined the Mennonites around 1610, 1609, 1610, something like that. All right, then, and now during the time he was beginning to question and all that, him and the guy Thomas Helwith, they were still in fellowship, quote unquote, uh, with one another. Uh, but then in 1611, the actual, the Baptist church that he founded, now he still had faithful followers. A lot of them started following, going with Thomas Helwith. Uh, they actually excommunicated him in 1611. And that's the same year the KJV Bible, at least part, the, the major part of that came out. And uh, so he was excommunicated by the Mennonites. And then uh, Helwis started a Baptist church. You know, he picked up the followers. Now, there were some that were loyal to Smith no matter what. But the bulk of them followed Thomas Helwis. And then he left, had back, went back to England, started the church, Baptist church in England, which is there to this day. And, uh, and then shortly after, um, yeah, shortly after Smith died, well, a couple years after Smith died, his loyal core followers joined up with the Mennonites. And that's why they share a history together and a number of points with the Mennonites. But uh, textbook history is also shared by them because of that connection between Smith and Hellweiss and Hellweiss and the Baptists and the Baptist Church in England. And then, of course, it came over to America, to the colonies after that. All right, but although Smith died as a Mennonite, he is still known as the founder of the Baptist Church. Uh, shortly after his death, his loyal followers emerged with the Mennonites. We mentioned that. And Hellas Baptist Church even remains today in London. I've been to London. I've seen some things in London, like the British Museum, but I've never seen that. But next time I'm there, I might, might go look that up. But then again, I might not, you know. It just depends on how much time I have. But anyway, what do we know about his legacy? 
Uh, his beliefs are traceable through his writings. He wrote a bunch of writings from 1603 to 1612. I have those listed in the book. His separation of church and state, again, influenced the pilgrims. But the main important point about Smith is what, do we, how, what are his strengths and weaknesses compared to restoration, compared to what the Bible says, all right? Well, um, whoops, I got this exact same thing on my own here, and I do the same thing at home. But anyway, um, he frequently revised his convictions, okay, according to his conscience. Now, that can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. Um, a lot of people would think of him as being wishy-washy. But me, being the positive, optimistic guy that I am, I tend to give him the benefit of the doubt, and that's why I subtitled that, An Unfulfilled Quest for Truth. I think he was trying to find the truth. Um, and he was seeking the truth. And when he finally found something he thought was the truth, he stuck with it. He did have convictions, like all these guys, all these Reformation guys did. They were convicted, and they were willing to risk their life for what they believed, which is a good, good thing, uh, even though what their belief may not have been exactly according to Scripture. Um, but when he found, when he discovered a weakness in his view, he would change, again, conviction and change that view to what he thought was scriptural. And so, you know, I, you know whether only God knows if he was really, you know, but anyway. Uh, but based upon his writings, I don't think he was, but anyway. Um, Smith uh, challenged the status quo doctrines of his time. Baptism, infant baptism is what he's known for mainly as the standout one, but there's a lot of doctrines and stuff he questioned. That's what led him out of the Church of England. That's what led him to start the Baptist Church. That's what led him into Mennonite and all that kind of stuff. He challenged the status quo. And so again, he was attacked from all sides. I mean, you know, uh, and you got to respect a person that would do that. Uh, he was accused of Pelag uh, Pelagianism. Uh, in other words, and, and really these two things, these two accusations, we get accused, I get accused of doing personal work with uh, denominationalists. Uh, salvation is achieved by good works. You're saying that, oh, if you say you have to be baptized, in fact, I was looking at our Facebook page, the School of Preaching, you know, we, we allow comments. We don't censor anything, which may be a bad thing. I don't know. But, um, you know, uh, we got people saying this is a false, oh, I guess it's the church web's uh, Facebook, not the School of Preaching, but the, we get some bad things about that too. <laughs> but the church website, oh, this is a false church because they teach baptism is necessary for the remission of sins. They're teaching work salvation. We get accused of that all the time. Or by opposing Calvinism, Armenianism, you know, opposed Calvinism. And again, he renounced Calvinism, at least to the public anyway, but some of his beliefs still held to it. Now, what, this is one of the quotes he says about baptism. Baptism is not washing with water, but it is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, the confession of the mouth, and the washing with water. How then can any man without great folly wash with water, which is the least and last of baptism? So, in other words, he considered baptism as being a threefold process. It is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I see my lines kind of moved over. Resolution issue there, I guess. Confession of the mouth. And finally, it involves washing with water. So he's saying all three of those things are involved in scriptural baptism is what he would say. And so if you baptize an infant, you're only doing that third one, the washing with water, which is the least important of all the things that, go, go, that are involved in baptism. Uh, now, of course, what he meant by baptism of the Holy Spirit is, I think, a reflection of traces of Calvinism. Uh, the confession of the mouth is something that an infant cannot do again. And so these are adults who know what they're believing, who know what they're confessing. And then finally, the, the immersion, the washing in water. And so, you know, and so he would say that uh, Roman Catholicism, that, that baptism is not scriptural because it only deals with the last of those. All right. But again, if that's his version of, uh, of baptism, of course, Peter said it's not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, 1 Peter 3, 21, 20 and 21, right in there. But anyway, um, if that was his view of baptism, then, of course, he was unscriptural, even though the immersion part was correct, the confession part was correct, but the rest of that uh, was not exactly as the Scriptures teach. All right, Smith is known for worship must be from the heart. And we would agree with that, John 4, 24, spirit and in truth. But what he meant by that was the Holy Spirit has to lay on you what you're going to preach. He said that praying, preaching, and singing must always be spontaneous from the heart. Uh, and he's the earliest one I can trace this back to. 
you know, we, and it's common today for denominational preachers to say, well, I don't, I'm just going to get up and whatever the Holy Spirit lays on my heart, that's what I'm preaching that day. Well, that goes back to Smith right there. Uh, but he also believed that with prayer and preaching. Now, again, he's coming from a, from a religion, from a, uh, and I'm not going to use the Bible, but I'll use this home book, even though, well, it is the Bible. Anyway, you know, you ever been in one of those churches that have the prayer manual? Everything is by the book. They have a book for everything. In fact, when I was a student at the School of Preaching in 1989, my grandmother died in Michigan. So I had to go up there and do her funeral. And, of course, I just had the, quote, eulogy part of that. And, the, the, and she was an Anglican church there. And they had this book they read and, you know, this and that and the other thing. I lived next door to Lutherans one time. And every prayer they would pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for the bread. Or Our Father which art in heaven, thank you for the weather or whatever. And so it all had that, that what do you call that, the, the ritual, the wrote, wrote, you know, just, and that's what he was, he was opposing with that, pre, but he went the other way. It had to be completely spontaneous. Also, no translations allowed in worship. You either read and study from the Greek or Hebrew text, or you don't bring that stuff up at all in worship. Because to him, translations were man-made, and so they were not, they were less than the direct word of God. Uh, now, we can be that some way sometimes. Now, I use the King James translation. I have all my notes at the School of Preaching are based on the King James translation, over a thousand pages of notes. But if we start making this a test of fellowship, uh, we, we've gone too far. We're binding what God is not bound. Uh, translations are tools. They're expedients. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Some more, some less. But all of them are like that. But uh, he was a, and I, I, hey, I wish everybody knew Greek. I wish I knew it better myself. They, oh, we use the Greek Testament. Let's just use that. I'd be all for that. Uh, but anyway, Smith uh, also no, no state-sponsored churches, which again, coming out of that background, uh, and what he meant by state-sponsored, you have to believe it this way, or civil persecution penalties. Uh, also, individuals should not, uh, or should, they should be allowed, or they should not be forced to certain views and then being punished if you don't hold those views. And he also, uh, now again, his system of pastors and deacons was not scriptural, but it was a huge step away from the pope, the bishops, the cardinals, and all that stuff going on. But he narrowed that down to local churches as a twofold organization of pastors and deacons. Now, we would agree with that if he meant by pastors, elders, but that's not what he meant by elders. He meant, uh, you know, preachers, the pastoral epistles, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was a huge step away from that hierarchy that we even see today that he faced in his day. And so I want to close with this slide, and this really is the, uh, and I'm sure in this we're going to get to, in this series of lectureships, uh, they'll get to, y'all, we will get to, the Brotherhood will get to at, at um, Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, we'll get to the Restoration Movement and all this. But he, the thing that just, the Restoration plea is valid then as it was today. Uh, again, my optimistic view of him is, he is his views are constantly changing because he's getting closer and closer to truth. Now, again, unfulfilled, I think, was his quest because uh, he died young, tuberculosis. But how many of them? Yeah, because as a matter of fact, in the restoration movement, you hear this. I know um, uh, Brother Kaiser, who has, by the way, forgiven me since last night, so he's all good. Uh, he's the elect now, okay? Um, but anyway... <laughs> Um, you see that in Ghana sometimes. You know, these restoration preachers, they would go and convert whole churches. Now, now again, you know, you have to take that kind of, you have to really analyze that. How do you really convert a whole church? Are they just following the preacher or whatever? But you see that in areas like this. And how many, and I know we don't have that today. We're more skeptical, which can be good or bad. But how many John Smiths are out there today? They might even be in religious robes denominational robes looking for the truth. They're out there. And uh, it's up to us to get the word to them. And uh, if John Smith had come across one of our preachers today, uh, he may very well have been baptized into Christ for the remission of his sins like the Bible teaches. Uh, but I say all that to encourage us, especially us preacher types and even church members, don't write a guy off because he's wearing some goofy robe from the Middle Ages. Um, he may be looking for the truth. And uh, let's approach everybody as if they've never heard the true gospel before 
And let's have a, a, a dialogue and a Bible study with them and see where that leads. And uh, that's the main lesson of all of these. The restoration plea is still valid. There's still people there searching for the truth. I appreciate your attention, and may God bless the hearing of His Word and the study of these religions.